Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Garden Hill, Mount Vernon. We know it's a holiday weekend. <laughs> Great to see you here uh, coming out and worshiping with us today. We hope you enjoy the service today. Please feel free to worship in spirit and truth this morning. If you feel like clapping, clap. If you feel like standing, stand. You want to raise your hands, raise your hands. If you want to just sit there and be a person and join and soak it all in, do that as well. Whatever it is that, and however it is that you worship, feel free to do so. Let's pray. Holy God, our Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the day, Lord, and the blessings of it. God, we thank you so much that you love us unconditionally. And Father, we thank you that you have supplied for us uh, our needs, not necessarily our wants, but our needs every day. Father, I ask your blessings on our church. Father, those who are here and those who are not. Father, for those who might be sick or, or suffering from some sort of illness or uh, might be bereaved in some way, Father, we ask you to reach down and comfort them. Now, Father, as we prepare our hearts for worship, we ask your Holy Spirit to go before us, lead us, guide, and direct us. And may you truly, truly bless Brother Steve this morning as he prepares to bring his message. Praise in your name. Amen.
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours. You are mine. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. And for all of you that are, that are here and for those that are joining us online, we're glad you're here. Uh, we're going to pause for a moment and pray and uh, give you a moment to uh, take up the offering. If you're here uh, with us today, just take the offering to the basket back there where Jim is. And if you're worshiping online with us, the, uh, uh, the website is www.gmvumc.org and go to Connect and, uh, and you can find a place there to give. But thank you for being here. Let's, uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for your constant presence with us, especially in these times of troubled waters. Uh, we know that you walk upon the water and that you are the master of the sea. So give us faith to know, God, that you are at work to heal and, and to strengthen and to bring comfort. Lord, we are just so thankful that you bless us in so many ways and as we bring back a portion of all the good things you give us, let us give it with glad and open hearts, knowing, God, that it's a part of building the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. It's in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. I feel like we need to sing that holy, holy, holy. That was good. <clears throat> want to remind you that we're still in a sermon series that I've called Fresh Fire. I want to remind you of Philippians 3. We've been reading this for a few weeks now. Not that I, the words of Paul to the church at Philippi, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I, everybody say, press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I hope everyone had a good and a safe Independence Day, or as our British friends would say, Colonist Treason Day, right? But <laughs> that's what King George would say, maybe. But anyway, I hope everybody was safe. I hope you got to eat hamburgers, and I hope you stayed healthy. I'm going to be in a story that you know well today. Somebody, uh, somebody brought it to my attention this week that back in April, GQ magazine, General, Gentleman's Quarterly, uh, posted a uh, list of 21 books that you really don't have to read. 
On that book was Lonesome Dove. People in Texas are really going to be ill about that. The Old Man in the Sea by Hemingway. They said, don't read it. They said, don't read Huckleberry Finn. And the Bible made that list. Don't read the Bible. Well, I would say this. Don't take your literary advice from a soft porn gentleman's fashion magazine. And you'll probably be okay. Amen? Amen. <laughs> this is a story that's in all four Gospels. It's the feeding of the 5,000. Have you ever heard of that one? I hope so. I'm going to read in Mark's account because there's a few things I want to stress that Mark stresses. So this is Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 30. <clears throat> and this is something I don't normally do. I'm using the King James Version of the Bible simply because the King James Version of the Bible is using... Uh, 16th, 17th century English and sometimes it's just more poetic than English we use today. But this is what the King James Version of the Bible says in Mark chapter 6 verse 30. The apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and they told him all things, both what they had done and you can read in the previous chapters everything that happened up to chapter 6. Mark moves very quickly so a lot had happened. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place. Everybody say desert place. And rest. For there were many coming and going, and they had, they had no leisure so much as to eat. They didn't even have time for a good meal because of the crowds. So they departed unto a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities, and out with them, and came together unto him. So the people were following him even into a desert place, out of all of the cities. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. They were like a sheep without a shepherd had no direction in their lives, had no meaning in their lives. They were oppressed not, not only by the Romans, but by a religious institution that was very legalistic. And so they came out of the cities and they gathered unto him and Jesus looked at them and he had compassion on them. <clears throat> and when the day was now far spent, the day was almost over. His disciples came unto him and said, this is a, three times Mark said, this is what? A desert place. Must be important, right? And now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. So uh, the disciples were being very practical. This is practical theology. We're in a desert place, and all these people have followed us out here, and we're a long way away from the city or any place where we can get food, and you've been teaching them all day long, and now they're hungry. And you know what happens as the, as the day goes long and you get hungry, you get, you get ill, amen? If I get hungry, I get ill, don't y'all? Send them away that they may go into the country and buy themselves bread. And Jesus said in verse 37, He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. He said, You give them <laughs> something to eat. And they said unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worths of bread and give them to eat? And otherwise they're saying, It would take a half a year's wages to feed all these people. And he saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they said, Five and two fishes. Now, the plural of fish is fish, except in the King James Bible where the plural of fish is fishes, right? And he commanded them to make all, listen to this. Now, he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. 
And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when they had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, when he had taken, when Jesus had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and he blessed them. And he broke the loaves. And he gave it to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes he divided among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And that does not include women and children. Some people think there's between 12 and 15,000 people there. And they were all filled with five loaves and two fishes. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to talk about today miracles in the desert. Three times we're told by Mark that this was a desert place. And we are living in a time now when we feel like we're lost in the desert uh, much of the time. We feel like we're going to perish. And we feel like things are never going to get better. And we feel like sometimes God has abandoned us or God does not hear us. And even when we pray, we have a hard time a lot of times praying because we can't see where God is at work in all of this. We want God to bring us to our destination quickly. I think one thing about modern life that I've recognized is that air travel has changed us so much because you don't get to take that long car ride, or if you want to go back further, that long buggy ride to visit another place or another town, even in the world, you can jump on an airplane and life is no longer about the journey, it's just about the destination. And Jesus teaches us over and over again, if you read carefully in the scriptures, that the destination, uh, that the journey is probably more important than the destination. What you experience along the way in the journey. I can remember when I was a kid, mom and daddy had a great big old Chevrolet Impala. Y'all remember those things? And this was before the time we were worried about putting kids in the car seat. Amen. And back in the back window of that big old Impala, there was a shelf that my sister and I both fit on. And we would be traveling. When we got tired, they'd put us back in the back window of that car and we'd lay there and watch the clouds go by and take a nap. Y'all remember that? Did y'all ever take snacks on a long trip? Things that kids would never eat today like bologna and bread or a cheese sandwich, right? <clears throat> didn't stop along the way. You ate along the way. And a lot of times, and this got real tricky, they didn't stop for bathroom breaks either. That got real tricky. Okay. But it was about the, there were adventures in the journey. You can go and you can sit with older people, people that are older than I am. Some of them may be in, the, in nursing homes now, but you can sit down with them and they'll tell you life stories about their journey. They won't tell you as much about the destination as they will relate to you what happened on the journey. Right? And of course, sometimes they put a little jam on the bread to make the story more interesting, right? But it's about the journey. For some reason, and when I was reading this scripture, it made me think about the birth of Benjamin. The Benjamin was born to Rachel and Jacob. Benjamin was Rachel's second and last child, and, and they had not arrived at their destination. They were still along the journey, and Rachel had Benjamin, and she died in childbirth. It happened on the journey. It didn't happen... At the destination. Sometimes things along the journey are very difficult. And we can look back on our life journey and we can think about that difficult, stressful time where we cross through the valley of the shadow of death. But it's about the journey. I remember in Luke 24, there, and this story is only in Luke 24, it's nowhere else. It, Jesus tells the story of, of two travelers traveling from the seven miles from Jerusalem to the little town of Emmaus. And they're traveling along and they're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. Everything they had witnessed in Jerusalem. And someone, a stranger, came up and began to walk with them toward Emmaus. And he was telling them and explaining to them from the scriptures everything that had happened in Jerusalem and why it had to happen. And when they got to Emmaus, when they got to their destination and they went into their home, the stranger was going to travel on. He was going to continue on his journey. But they invited him into the house. And they invited him to the table. And when he got to the table, 
he took the bread and he gave thanks to God and he broke it and he gave it to them. And when the bread was broken, they recognized that this stranger they had been traveling with all this time was Jesus himself, the resurrected Lord. And all of a sudden he vanished from their sight. The story that they had to tell after that was a story of the journey. It was not a story of the destination. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says, Those that wait upon the Lord will mount up on wings as eagles. They will walk and not faint. They will run and not grow weary. And it's all about waiting on the Lord. Patience. Why are we in such a hurry to get to a destination when there's a long journey ahead of us? So Jesus led the disciples to a desert place. He, he took them to a desert place because he knew they were not going to find any rest in the city. There was, there was too much going on. Too much had happened. The disciples had worked too many miracles. Jesus' fame had spread. People were following Jesus by the thousands and Jesus didn't have a Twitter account. And he didn't have Facebook. And he didn't have online worship. And he didn't have a microphone. And he didn't have a podcast. And he didn't write blogs. Amen? He gathered thousands of people because he was that good a preacher. Amen? <laughs> he was that good. And so people would follow him everywhere he went, and he led them into a desert place trying to find a place where he didn't think people would follow him, and they even followed Jesus out into the desert. They were so attracted to him. Jesus did not lead them in the comfort. <laughs> and I think sometimes when we follow Jesus, we make the mistake of thinking that everything's just always going to be okay. Well, sometimes Jesus is journeying to the desert where there's no water and where there's no food. And he's saying, come away with me to a desert place. Jesus preached to a raging sea, and he said, peace be still. <laughs> and that's a message a lot of us need to hear. We have a hard time being still. During this COVID-19 time when we are all in the house together, folks, there are marriages breaking up. Because couples are forced for the first time in many years to actually have to spend time together and be still, and they have figured out that they don't like each other. We need those times to be still. Have you ever followed Jesus into a desert place? Have you ever had a desert experience? There's always a problem when you get to the desert. <laughs> There's always a problem. Satan does not attack you when everything's okay. And Satan doesn't attack people that he already has. He doesn't have to. He's already got them. He attacks you when times are tough and when you've got a problem and you don't see your way through the other end of it. That is when he attacks you. That is when he is trying to get you. It is when you get to that desert place. Where, how are we going to feed all these people? You know, we were supposed to come out here, Jesus, to take a break. <laughs> no, 12,000 people followed us. And they've been here all day, and it's the desert, and there's no food. How are we going to feed them? There's always a problem when you get to a desert place. There's always problems. When you're on a journey, car breaks down. I remember a youth trip where they took the van to Gatlinburg and they got up on top of the mountain to a chalet and the transmission fluid was just pouring out of it. I had to go borrow another bus from another church <laughs> and go get them. Amen. There's always, we left that van there. It was in such bad shape. We just sold it. Amen. Sometimes you leave things in the desert, things you love very dearly. The disciples diagnosed the problem, but
but they didn't have the solution. And a lot of times, folks, when we're going through desert places in the church, it's real easy to diagnose the problem, but it's hard to come up with a solution. Where are all the people? How are we going to get through this? What's the church going to look like when we come out the other side of COVID? What about the young people? Are we going to use all, lose all of the young people? We're losing them already. And we can diagnose the problem, but we can't come up with a solution. So Jesus said, you feed them. He said, come up with a solution. You feed them. Don't send them away. They're following us for a reason. There's life in the words that I speak, disciples, so you feed them. How are we going to feed them, Lord? It takes six months' wages, and we have to go find food, and we have to buy it, and we have to bring it back to the desert. How are we going to do that? Jesus said, well, what do you have? We always concentrate on what we don't have. Jesus said, what do you have? All we got is five crackers and two sardines. Five, <laughs> five loaves and, and two fishes. What does that add up to? Seven. Wow, seems like I read that before. Jesus said, bring it here. And John tells us in his account that it was a little boy that had his little greasy bag of lunch with him. And that was his lunch. One little boy had his lunch with him. Can you imagine mama in the morning? Don't forget to take your lunch. So bring me what you've got. So they bring the, 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 the bread and they bring the fish. And what does Jesus do? He gives thanks to God. He blesses it and then he breaks it. And then he gives it to them. He blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it to them. On the road to Emmaus, he took the bread and he, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. At the Last Supper, he, he took the bread and he, and he gave thanks and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. At Mount Calvary, Jesus, God took Jesus and nailed him to the cross. He blessed Jesus, he broke Jesus, and he gave Jesus to us. And in our lives, if we want to be disciples of Jesus, we have to give our lives to him so we can be blessed and then so we can be broken and so God can give us to the world. You want to know where the miracle lies? It lies in the breaking. Show me somebody that's never been broken and I'll show you a self-righteous, judgmental, mean-spirited person. But give me somebody that God has blessed and broken. And they can feed a multitude. They can feed a multitude. Jesus said, divide them up into fifties and hundreds. Isn't that interesting? Well, you got a bunch of hungry folks and you got a bunch of ill folks, so you got to instill some order, right? If you're going to follow Jesus, you can't do it in a disorderly manner. We got to have some order here. So there's 10 or 12, 15,000 of them. And, and, God, and Jesus said to the disciples, you divide them up into 50s and, hundred, and hundreds, and I bet they were real happy about that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Get back over there with your mama. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Y'all quit moving around. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, where was I at? 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Y'all sit down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Quit milling around. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 22. 26, y'all come over here, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Okay, y'all sit down. Okay, Peter, you count out the hundreds. You count out the hundreds. What did they have to learn? in that what did you have to learn in that everybody's tired everybody's hungry and there's a crowd and there's a desert and and everybody's ill what do you learn 
patience. <laughs> Something the American psyche knows very little about. Patience. If you be patient and let the Lord get to you, because he's counting everybody, <laughs> but when the Lord gets to you, hold up your hand, Lord, say, I'm here, and I'm ready to be fed. Amen? A lot of times we see somebody else getting fed, or we see somebody else being blessed, and we get jealous. And we don't think of the, the, the we don't think that, hey, wait a minute, eventually they're going to get to me, and I'm going to be counted. Amen? If I stay here in this desert place with Jesus long enough, if I am patient, I'm going to be counted. And I'm going to be fed. Have you ever noticed what God in the scriptures does with so little? Wow. Touch the hem of his garment, just the hem, and be healed. One little flask of oil that refuses to go empty. One little handful of meal that refuses to run out. A coin drawn from the mouth of a fish <laughs> to pay taxes. And one little boy's lunch to feed a multitude in a desert place. Have you ever wondered if you, have you ever just thought I'd, I just don't have enough. I don't have enough. There's not enough that I have. I can't do anything with what I've got. Oh, to him who is exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think according to the power that works in us to be, and be glory. He's exceedingly above anything we can ask or think. And the power is in his hands and the multiplication is in his hands. And when we take what we have as little as it might be and place it in the master's hands, he he blesses it and he breaks it and he gives it. The great thing about this is they took up 12 fragments, right? This is leftovers. This is stuff people had already chewed on. <laughs> and Jesus said, let's not waste it because even the fragments and what's left over is important. Twelve baskets of leftovers. Twelve baskets of leftovers. Before Joseph could become a ruler in Egypt, he had to go through the pit and through the prison. Before Paul could plant the seeds of the gospel of Jesus Christ all over Asia Minor, first he had to be broken on the road to Damascus and knocked off of his beast in a blinding light and hear the words of Jesus speak to him. Before Peter could become the leader of the apostles, he had to deny Jesus three times and go through a valley so deep and dark that he thought he would never recover from it. <laughs> he had to be broken for that. Have you let... There's miracles that happen in the desert <laughs> when we go through those desert places there's miracles there it's then that God blesses us and remember the, the miracles in the breaking break how are we going to come out of this on the other side church <laughs> are we going to be broken and offered or will we refuse to be broken? We will, will we refuse to put ourselves in the hands of the master? One thing I noticed in this scripture is that even though they were in a desert place, Jesus said, let them sit down on the grass. Did y'all notice that? Why? What's grass doing in the desert place? <laughs> When I look back at the times when I was broken, you know what I see? Grass. <laughs> there was a grassy place there that I maybe missed before. That in the midst of that desert I went through, the grace was there with me. Amen. There's miracles in this desert, folks. 
We just have to place ourselves in the hands of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we honor you today and we thank you for those times in our lives that it seems so difficult where we are just so broken. Lord, we know that the miracle lies in the breaking and the giving and the receiving. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being with us in this desert place because one day we will look back with our 12 baskets of fragments. We will look back and we will see where the grass grew in that desert place. And we will praise your name in the middle of this desert. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on the destination, but also our eyes on the journey. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.